This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We are officially underway for both the NBA and Stanley Cup Finals. Game number two in the Stanley Cup Finals is tonight with Game 3 in the NBA coming up on Wednesday. We're going to talk to Austin Swain today to get his thoughts on both those games and talk some series-level prices for both of those series. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research, joined here as mentioned by Austin Swain. Check him out on X at a swain three find his work over at fan duel research awesome happy monday to you how you doing today i'm doing great jim uh we had a great nba finals game last night it, very intrigued to see what's going on in hockey tonight as well i think it's a huge turning point for that series so we'll dive into that and you know not not much gets better this time of year u.s open around the corner so it's a good good time on the sports calendar yeah, U.S. Open coming up this week. We'll talk about that with Brandon Gadula on Wednesday. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff lined up this week. The Euros are this week, so Dr. Ed Feng is with us on Thursday. And we're talking some NBA or WNBA with Annie Nader of FanDuel Research tomorrow. So big week on tap here on covering the spread. And we'll get plenty of NBA and NHL thoughts in there as well. So make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, you can find the show on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV Plus as well. We'll dive into the NBA first with Austin in a second. We're going to go NBA first in case you're listening to this on Tuesday. Don't want to skip through the NHL stuff. If you want to skip ahead to the NHL stuff, I'll put a timestamp for that in the description over on FanDuel Research, description on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So if you want to skip ahead to NHL, please feel free to do so. But we'll put the NBA first to keep things a bit more orderly for those of you listening on Tuesday or Wednesday. The NBA Finals are here and FanDuel's getting giving you the chance to win alongside the champions because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with a winning $5 bet. That's $200 to use on same game parlays, live bets, and so much more. There is no better place to bet all the finals action than America's number one sports book. Just download the app and take an, a shot, an extra 200 bucks. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA, must be 21 or it must be 18 plus in DC and 21 plus in select states. First online real money wager only, $5 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non withdrawable bonus bets, which expire seven days after receipt restrictions apply see terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash rg in colorado dc iowa kentucky michigan new jersey north carolina ohio pennsylvania illinois tennessee vermont virginia and wyoming call 1-800 next step or text next step to 53342 in arizona 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9 with it in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700. Visit chaosgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Oh, I actually changed that one. Uh, it, they changed the phone number here. 1-877-770-7867 in Louisiana. That might be stop as well. S-T-O-P. It is stop. Okay. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. I don't know if they put the, the, the letters on the keyboards anymore. So maybe that's why they switched the numbers. But yeah. uh, I'm old enough to remember where the num the letters were. So, you Me know. Too, unfortunately. Yeah. Actually, no, that isn't stop. Yeah, no, it is. Okay. Whatever. Anyway. Call that number if you need help in Louisiana. Uh, MD Gambling Health at Oregon, Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia. Hope is here. Visit GamblingHelpLineMA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Let's begin things, Austin, by talking about that interesting game two you mentioned last night in the NBA where... The Mavericks, you know, kept things a lot closer than they did in game one. There were some questions around Luka Doncic's, Doncic's health heading into that one. But the Celtics still wound up winning that game by seven. So I want to talk about game two specifically first. Did you see anything different from the Mavs there in order to inspire any hope of a tighter series? Or is it still pretty much all Boston here? Um, frankly, no, uh, <laughs> I wish I had, you know, cause we, like, obviously we'd probably want a closer competitive series if you, if you're an unbiased fan here, but yeah. like, 
the amazing thing to me is that the Celtics main offense from downtown has largely been absent for the last three halves of play, but they've used a home court advantage. Mavs not shooting well and really some poor interior defense to still be up to, Oh, they're 15 for their last 54 threes in the last three halves of play. That's just 27.8%. They're 36.2% overall from the playoffs and arguably the best team in the NBA this year. So now that that shooting will swing in the other direction, likely in one of these next two games in Boston, it's a really tough sell for the Mavericks. And I think a huge factor of this is Luka Doncic's injury. Now, it hasn't hurt him offensively, so you might say he's just fine, but he's been a constant target on defense. He's arguably got like an NBA Finals MVP argument, despite being on a landslide losing team here, just because no one from Boston is exceptionally separated. It's not going to happen, but he's got a case. But um, Jason Timp's a good friend of mine. Hoops Tonight podcast, great film based analysis podcast i listen to every single nba playoff series he talked last night it's now a three-step process for dallas to get back in the series Kyrie and luca have to be more efficient as individual scorers then creating looks for other guys which they have to make and by the way they've got to do all of that stuff while boston's likely going to start making more threes right. on the other end it all four of those things happening in the four of the next six games against the team with the best net rating in the nba this year there's a reason boston's minus 1000 will win the series right now yeah, they're minus 1,000. The Mavericks were plus 666, uh, which is daunting. It's Oof. kind of scary. Uh, earlier on, they're now plus 660. So thankfully, some better decided to take the Mavericks and get them off plus 666. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for your service. Salute to you. They probably uh, just took it for the ticket, right? So that it will. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, you want that one just for funsies. You know, screenshot that one and enjoy it until it loses. Um, but if we're looking at the series prices here, right now... The Celtics are plus 270 to sweep this series, uh, a four total game series here. And you talked about the poor shooting for the Mavericks, too. Part of that's like Kyrie. And like mm -hmm. we know that Kyrie is a better shooter than what he's shown. But yeah. also, like, do you expect that to change? Or are we expecting this to be a tighter series? Any interest in the plus 270 for a sweep? Uh, what's your view of where the futures market stand right now? Yeah, so I, I did actually like a bet that was here in the market. Um, there, there are quite a few, so you have to kind of dig to get to it. It's uh, it's an over-under total games that still sits. I like under five and a half games at minus 152. Just looking at history here, that's not only a sweep, but it also encompasses what we call a gentleman's sweep, right, where Dallas would get one of them. Right. Um, if you look at the 322 NBA playoff series where the superior team on paper, the team with home court, goes up 2-0, 205 of those teams one in four or five games. So that's 63.7% of them. That's about minus 175 implied. So I actually think that this number is pretty good value, especially when Dallas isn't exactly the strongest case for the being the exception to the rule. The Doncic injury, Boston was minus 220 to win the series before it even started. They will shoot better here eventually soon. And Dallas has dropped a home game in every series so far. So all of those factors work toward Boston gets one of these next two and Dallas did not play very well in their building. So it's a lot of juice. I think it's more than a lot of people feel comfortable with saying that, hey, Boston's going to emphatically win in four or five games because it is difficult in the grand scheme of things. But it gets much easier once you win the first two. The math and the, the data and history says that I actually think it's a pretty good number. Yeah, minus 152, as you said, sitting around 60% as of right now for the Celtics to win the series. You were talking about the historical numbers, and I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of those series where the home team with home court went up 2-0, they probably weren't as heavily favored entering the series as right. Boston was, which implies even higher likelihood that the series is pretty short. So you get yourself the flexibility of, you know, it's not a sweep, but you get the extra game in there as well, especially as we head back down to Dallas, where, as we'll talk about game three here, the Mavericks are a favor by, by a point and a half. So I think that like, yeah, like you said, it's a lot to lay, but value is value. And it does sound like that's not a bad market right now. Yeah, Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about game three specifically, where the Mavericks are favored by a point and a half on Wednesday night. The total in this game is 213. Which bets stand out to you at first glance for game three, Austin? Yeah, so I am actually preferring a target of the total here. I like over 213 points. One of the big reasons why I like Boston to win quickly, I've been talking about their shooting regression, but Dallas definitely has some coming too. We were talking, you you even set it up. Kyrie Irving, largely responsible, probably plays better away from the booze. I know I'd probably work and perform better a little bit away from getting Same. booed every time I was doing something. So you look at Boston and Dallas in the playoffs, 56.4% effective field goal rate for Boston, 54% for Dallas. In the first 
two games of this series, both have dropped at least two percentage points from that 54.2 on the Boston side, 51.1 for Dallas. The pace of the series is actually pretty good for NBA playoff standards, 93.8. The shots have just not been falling for either of these teams. That is eventually a math equation. And both of them have talented offensive scores. Like I was talking about earlier, Dallas getting more looks for their role players. Role players tend to play better at home. Um, this total is now one and a half points shorter than it was to open the series after we've seen two consecutive unders. I think it's a good opportunity to zag from the market, end up going with an over as these teams start to make a few more shots in game three. And I think that the key thing here is you expect both sides to shoot better. If it yeah. were just one side where it's like, okay, you know, Kyrie is lagging, but the Celtics have been white hot, then maybe you could see yourself considering this being low scoring again. But <laughs> like you said, it is kind of both sides that haven't really reached their full potential as of yet. Yeah, absolutely. And in those particular situations, hypothetically, if that was the case, I look toward team totals instead. I do that a lot in the right. WNBA as well, where if I'm a little concerned that one team's been shooting the lights out and it probably isn't sustainable, I'll flip to a team total if the pace checks out and it's pretty good. Okay, so you're liking the over a 213. Any player props stand out to you in game three? I think I've kind of spoiled it at this point. I like Kyrie Overing over to a 23 and a half points. I'm avoiding a side in this one because I'm expecting, like I said, Boston to potentially drop one of these next two. Game three is colloquially, refer colloquially referred to as the buzzsaw game. It very well could be this one. You see Dallas is a slight favorite on FanDuel. That'll make my strategy for a side more clear in game four, but I'm just expecting a better Kyrie Irving, as I said, at home, away from the booze. He still has a 24.4% usage rate in the series. That's really healthy considering how much Luka Doncic is actually still shooting the ball. Still just shooting 35.1% from the field, 13 for 37. It sounds as ugly as it's been to watch if you see some of the mid ranges and just things that Kyrie normally is seemingly automatic. Um, I mean, Kyrie victimized both my Clippers and your Timberwolves. Hasn't looked even close to the same in the first two games. He shot 47.1%. For the playoffs overall against some of those other top shelf defenses, I think he comes back at some point. And number flyer has him projected for 27.2 points in this game, given the current role, given how many minutes he's playing. And Boston can be a little leaky with perimeter defense. I think the overs the side to be on. It, it, you kind of have to hold your nose a little bit to take it, but um, seems like good value. And both this and the over correlate well because you are buying into. Part of the reason you're buying the total is because you expect shooting regression from Kyrie Irving, and then you expect shooting regression from the Celtics as well. So yep. this is another spot to consider potentially a same game parlay. Of course, FanDuel does know that those two bets are correlated with you taking it over in two separate spots. Uh, Kyrie over 23 and a half points. The total over 213 is plus two of seven of FanDuel Sportsbook. So you are paying a tax. And like, I want to make that clear, but again, it, it plays into the same assumption. So is that something you'd be okay tying together or would you prefer to play those bets individually? No, I, I definitely think that if you're going to target a same game parlay, I love this particular angle because it's all of that shooting regression angle encompassed into one. You could even look Jason Tatum sub 20% from three in this series. Like there are a lot of things that are uncharacteristic from stars that have happened so far in the game that it eventually turns around it probably turns around in mass. We're dealing with a very small sample size. Maybe Tatum just struggles from three all series. Maybe Kyrie never gets it going. But in this particular case, this is the type of same game parlay that I'd feel more comfortable targeting. Okay. And again, those markets are the uh, total over 213 and then Kyrie over 23 and a half points minus 102 for individual legs. And if you want to put them together, plus 207 right now for both those together at FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's talk now about the Stanley Cup Finals because we have got game number two coming up tonight between the Oilers and the Panthers. On the NHL side of things, Austin, we had Tom Vecchio on to preview this series. And Tom talked about how stifling the Panthers' defense can be yeah. prior to game one. And that played out because they won game one, three nothing. So well, did that game change your view of the series at all? Or was it kind of what you were expecting coming in? Yeah, uh, Tom and I have a little bit of a grudge match on the series. He likes Florida. Oh. I like Edmonton, which I think is fun because like, it's like, you know, we, we have a little bit of bragging rights on the line here, but it definitely did. I think even Florida Panthers backers might've been a bit surprised by how game one looked because Edmonton and Florida are both exceptional team level skating defenses, two of the top three teams in expected goals allowed in the playoffs. And then there's a second level to NHL defense, which is why I think it's so hard to predict is the goaltending aspect. And that is where Florida dominated in game one. Sergei Bobrovsky was fantastic, had 32 saves. 
it's weird to say this, but Edmonton dominated a game. They lost three to nothing. Shots on goal were 32 to 17. Expected goals were 3.74 to 1.85, but goaltending is fickle. It is random and it can be challenging to target and keep expecting that to work over and over again in a seven game series. I was more impressed with Edmonton in game one, which like, you know, Tom and I would have bragging rights about actual versus expected. I think it's why game two is so exciting. And if Edmonton can, can steal game two tonight, this is an entirely different series by public perception. But I don't think at this point that many are leaving that game one where they were shut out and feeling like Edmonton has a great chance in the series. Well, looking at the the series here, part of the yeah. thought process for not expect that regression is that he, you know, Sergei Bobrovsky has been kind of playing out of his mind. Yep. So at what point, like, cause he's been doing this for a bit now during the playoffs. At what point do we just right. say, okay, he's good. I can't put a lot of faith in expected goals. Like I, I agree with you where I expect regression typically, but like, at what point do we just admit the dude's good? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, my colleague that I've worked with, Brandon Gadul, we were looking into this uh, earlier in the spring, actually, because we were trying to develop an NHL model and figuring out what we could do with goaltending because it can be so yeah. random year to year and things like that. The reality is the most corollary aspect to um, goal saved above expectation, which is the advanced metric for um, for goalies, it's team level defense. And that's the most corollary aspect. So nothing can tends to correlate quite like team level defense. I feel like that if Edmonton is continuing to get the shot opportunities, especially high danger opportunities, Sergey is eventually going to crack. We, especially when you talk about usually expected goals undersell star power. Well, here's Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, and Zach Hyman. Pretty good. So, yeah, um, yeah they, they're, they're not too bad. So, like, this is the top of the top. This is the best of the best. Both of these defenses and offenses are top five in the playoffs. Like they're here for a reason. Um, I would not want to continue to expecting to ride Bobrovsky. That's just my own personal take. But if you're if you're a believer in in Bob, I totally get it. Yeah, we can admit that Bobrovsky is good. We, but we can also admit that, that McDavid and Drysaddle are pretty good too. Yeah. So let's take a look at the series level prices here, Austin. With that game win, game one win, the Panthers now minus two fifty to win the Stanley Cup at FanDuel Sportsbook. Oilers still plus two hundred two. Uh, mm -hmm. The total for the series over five and a half games minus one seventy eight. Where are you seeing value in the series prices right now? Yeah, I certainly think this is a challenging market because if Edmonton comes out and their their better performance between the creases plays out and they win, you probably won't get Edmonton at a better price than this for until at least game six. So if you believe in Edmonton, plus 202 is a pretty good number. But if you expect the Panthers to win tonight, this will probably be as low as it gets as well, because then they'll be up to oh, probably a minus 500 or greater series favorite heading to Edmonton, especially if that expected goal differential turns around. It certainly could because Florida is not short on excellent goal scorers and skaters as well. You know, Matthew Kachuk, Carter Verhage and and the like. I would be more inclined to bet the Oilers based on what we saw in game one. I I still have a feeling that this is going to be a push bowl dynamic of Bobrovsky against the Edmonton Stars lower scoring games across the board um which which goes a little tongue in cheek with what I'm what I'm picking out for a prop in game 2 but generally lower scoring games and it's still tied 2-2 after game 4 so technically you could say Edmonton is value here I already have a serious position so I'm going to hold firm right now until I get a a different result um, but there are key differences why even if Edmonton loses tonight I feel differently than I feel about the Mavericks Edmonton stars are healthy. They're outperforming Florida between the creases. At least they did in game one. And there's a long, long journey back to Alberta. The travel doesn't get much further than Edmonton, Alberta and Sunrise, Florida. And that's the plane ride we're going to have that can completely swing the dynamic of this series. So I can't wait to find out. Little mental reset on the plane might be a good yeah. thing if, if things don't go well for Edmonton yeah. for tonight. So some interest in Edmonton plus two hundred two, but largely a stay away there. What about for game number two tonight, Austin? Where the Panthers are minus one forty to win, with the Oilers at plus one sixteen total, five and a half minus one ten at both sides. What stands out to you for game two specifically? So I do think we see more scoring than three total goals in game two. And we saw in game one for Edmonton, I've, we talked about Bobrovsky, but Stuart Skinner on Edmonton side, negative 5.07 goals saved above average. He's largely been the weak link, the place where Edmonton fans wanting the first Canadian Cup since 93 are holding their breath. And he didn't exactly perform to expectation. He let in two on 17 shots. There was an empty netter, but I don't really want to target Skinner on the road in such a volatile place, but I do like Edmonton's team total 
over two and a half goals. It's just minus 118 since they're an underdog here. 3.74 expected, as I said in the first round. I know Bobrovsky is going to be an obstacle, but just one of the better offenses in the playoffs, 3.11 expected uh, per 60 minutes. And this was Edmonton's first time getting shut out since April 3rd. It was just a, it's a wild result when you consider how consistently Edmonton's been on the board multiple times. There are a lot of different paths here. There, this could be three regulation goals against Bobrovsky, two regulation goals as an empty net, two regulation goals in an overtime win. There are a lot of options on the table for an offense that I thought played well from a skating level in game one. Number fire has Edmonton at 2.78 goals. I think there's a smidge of value here and as close as I get to wanting to bet the traditional market. Okay, that is over two and a half goals for Edmonton, currently minus 118 at FanDuel Sportsbook for Edmonton to go over on that team total. You mentioned a player prop earlier on. What's that player prop you're targeting here for game two? Yeah, I, I guess I just love corollary player props today because uh, I'm looking at Leon Dreisaitl to score. He's plus 185, and a lot of these goal score odds are longer because the, the uh, expectation for scoring is so low. But if you exclude an end-of-the-season stretch where Edmonton was kind of resting their guys a little bit, there was one four-game stretch all season where Leon Dreisaitl hadn't scored. This would be the second if he fails to score in game two. He's been one of the most consistent shot takers and shot makers for the Oilers. And it's not really short on effort. He was seven shot attempts in his last three games, had four shots on goal in game one specifically. He hit a pipe back in Dallas. Like a lot of bad luck here for Dreisaitl. He is, this is just 35.1% implied odds to score, but he has 10 goals in 19 playoff games so far has that spot down low on the Oilers power play where he's been so consistent delivering at the side of the net. I think he's part of the team total I'm targeting. And it's been a long time since we've seen Leon on the board for his standards. I hate the word do, but feels a little due to me. It's regression, just regression. Absolutely. That's all it is. Uh, yeah. So re due for regression is Leon Dreisaitl. Austin likes him to score plus 185 at FanDuel Sportsbook and the Edmonton team total over two and a half goals. That is minus 118. That is Austin Swaim. Find him on X at a Swaim three. Find his work at FanDuel Research and over on the FanDuel Research podcast feed as well. Austin, I appreciate the time as always. Enjoy the game tonight. Enjoy game three on Wednesday as well. We'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good, Jim. I'll see you soon. All righty. Big thank you once again to Austin Swaim. Again, you can find him on X at a Swaim 3. Going to close up shop before this week by recapping recommendations from last week here on the show, beginning with the Belmont Stakes. We had Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV on to preview the Belmont Stakes. You can find Christina on X at Christina FDTV. Her favorite bet for the Belmont Stakes was an exact of Sierra Leone to win and Seeds the Gray to finish second. And door knock really impressive in this race door knock wound up getting the win sierra leone finished third seeds the gray wound up finishing seventh in this one so couldn't quite get that one but good run at by door knock there other recommendation for christina was al rifa to win race 11 the second to last race at belmont for that day but measured time got the win there I want to extend a big thank you to christina for joining us and also other FanDuel tv talent dubs anderson Todd Shrupp for joining us throughout uh, this Triple Crown season. Hoping to get more horse racing coverage here on the show throughout the summer as well for other big races there. But shout out to Christina. Find her on X at Christina FDTV to find all of her fantastic work and FanDuel TV for all of your horse racing needs throughout this summer as well. I talked about some NASCAR and Formula One last week here on the show. Let's start things off with the NASCAR side of things. Four recommendations. One of them probably should have won, but did not. Uh, those recommendations were Tyler Reddick to win at 10 to 1. Kyle Busch top five at plus 380. Alex Bowman top five, eight to one. And then Chase Briscoe top 10 at four to one. Reddick won the opening stage, qualified second, uh, got a bit of damage at one point during the race. So Kyle Larson won. Kyle Larson deserved to win. You know, that one. It's within the range of outcomes where he qualifies well and wins the first stage, but doesn't win the race. So that makes sense for Reddick not to win at 10 to 1. The annoying one is Kyle Bush to to finish top five at plus 380. Bush was running inside the top five on the last lap, and he got spun by Ross Chastain. Martin Truex Jr. also ran out of gas uh, on that last lap. So even if Red or Chastain had passed Bush, Bush still would have gotten inside the top five uh, with that final spot, but didn't get there. Uh, as always, Ross, bit annoying. So uh, ruining that bet there with Kyle Bush. But I think the process of Bush was good, despite the fact he did qualify pretty poorly on Saturday. Uh, the other ones, again, Bowman top five, eight to one. Chase Briscoe top 10 at four to one. Neither of those cashed. In Formula One, 
I had either Charles Leclerc or Lando Norris to win plus 250 out in Montreal. And Mercedes was very surprising this weekend. George Russell won the pole. Lewis Hamilton at good speed during practice and the first couple rounds of qualifying as well. So Mercedes kind of came out of nowhere with their upgraded package, upgraded front wing for them. And that made it a bit of a four team race. Now, the Leclerc side of things got dumped early on because he qualified pretty poorly, did not make it into Q3. So he kind of knew then that he wasn't going to win. But but Norris did qualify third, running pretty well during the race and had things broken a little bit different. He could have gotten the win, but finished second and said behind Max Verstappen. I still think that Red Bull looks pretty vulnerable. Um, that might not be the case once they go back to more traditional racetracks, which they will be pretty soon in Barcelona. So Maybe we're back on Red Bull here in the very near future, but I feel good about the process for the Lando side of things. Unfortunate that Ferrari was not in the mix and just kind of had a poor weekend all around. So uh, no dice there on Leclerc or Lando to win in Montreal with Lando finishing second behind Verstappen. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. As mentioned, though, tomorrow we're going to talk some WNBA with Annie Nader of FanDuel Research, getting a read on some WNBA bets, transitioning from betting the NBA to the WNBA, and much more. Brandon Gandula with us on Wednesday to preview the U.S. Open. We got Dr. Ed Feng with us on Thursday talking Euros. So big week here on the show. We'll get more, some more NBA NHL talk in there as well. So make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast. And you can also find us on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV plus. If you got any questions for me, I am on X at Jim Sonis. You can also find FanDuel research on X at FanDuel research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets for NHL game. Number two, we'll talk to you once again soon. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network.